Hi everybody, this is Katya Eckhart here. Welcome to my YouTube channel. This evening I am wearing a new Michael Kors dress. This is a turtleneck dress, kind of a striped number. It uh, comes down to about mid-length. So uh, this is kind of um, also a new wave look. I love the stripes, the black and white stripes, and they go well with these black stockings and the black high heel shoes. So clicking on that for you. I hope everybody is having a good evening. Here you can get a good view of the dress from the side. It's good to see everybody again. It's been about a week since my last video, but I wanted to come back with some new content. So let me just do a couple more turns of the dress. I also have this Michael Kors clutch purse that I'm using as an accessory for the outfit. So let me give you a look at, the, uh, at it from this side. So I purchased this at a local store uh, where I had a lot of help from the saleswomen. So um, I like this outfit and it's very comfortable uh, and it can be used in a number of different venues. So it's quite versatile. So what I want to do tonight is have some fun. And what I'm going to do is uh, I want to read for you another Zen poem from uh, Luman. And I would like to, in this instance, uh, unravel the cone, or maybe let it unravel me, and uh, what I'm going to do is try to give what I consider to be an interesting Zen answer to this Zen cone. So let's get right down to business here. This also comes from the work that I've read from previously called Zen Flesh and Zen Bones, which is a collection of uh, these kinds of meditative works. So the name of this cone this is the third one in the series by Luman. The name of this cone is Butai's Finger. Butai is the name of a Buddhist monk who is a central character in this cone. So let me read the cone and then what I'm going to do is comment on it or kind of try to give a Zen answer to it to give you a feel for the practice of Zen uh, how it involves both meditation on the cone, but then also answering it in kind of the same language in which the cone itself is composed. So here's the Gutai's finger. Gutai raised his finger whenever he was asked a question about Zen. A boy attendant began to imitate him in this way. When anyone asked the boy what his master had preached about, the boy would raise his finger. Gutai heard about the boy's mischief. He seized him and cut off his finger. The boy cried and ran away. Gutai called and stopped him. When the boy turned his head to Gutai, Gutai raised up his own finger. In that instant, the boy was enlightened. When Gutai was about to pass through this world, he gathered his monks around him. I attained my fingers in, he said, from my teacher, Ten, Tenryu, Ten, Tenryu, and in my whole life I could not exhaust it. Then he passed away. Mumon's comment, enlightenment, which Gutai and the boy attained, has nothing to do with a finger. If anyone clings to a finger, Tenryu will be so disappointed that he will annihilate Gutai, the boy, and the clinger altogether. Gutai cheapens the teaching of Tenryu, emancipating the boy with a knife. Compared to the Chinese god who pushed aside a mountain with his hand, old Gutai is a poor imitator. So in this column, let me make a few comments and then I'm going to answer it in a Zen way. The cone is about, obviously on some level, not clinging to things. So Gutai raises his finger and the boy clings to that by imitating him. Gutai then cuts the boy's finger off and then when the boy runs away, Gutai calls him, the boy turns around and Gutai raises his finger and the boy is enlightened. So the, the, the this cone is about not clinging to things in, in anything in particular. Now, how would I answer this cone? Well, one thing I would say is that Gutai is a fool. Because Gutai, on the one hand, pardon the pun, 
is a monster because he's basically torturing this child or cutting his finger off, and this is certainly not compassionate, this is certainly very cruel, so he's a fool. And the boy maybe becomes enlightened, but if he has to lose his finger in order to do it, maybe that's not such a good thing. So I think Gutai is kind of a fool, and yet he's on his way to enlightenment. I think the boy is kind of silly because of his mischief, and because he's clinging to this gesture of imitating the Gutai until Gutai cuts off his finger, but then the boy is said to be enlightened, and Gutai is said to be enlightened, or at least on the way to that. And then there's the most interesting character to me in the entire cone, and that is the Chinese god who pushes aside the mountain with his hand. I would say that the Chinese god himself is not yet enlightened. He is not yet enlightened because he has not yet watched a child, a very small child, who is reclining on the side of the mountain with his hand buried in the clover on the side of the mountain. And so the Chinese god who has pushed the mountain aside with one hand thinks he's mastered this because of his great size and his giant hand. And so he's clinging to his power, his size, and his giant hand until he sees the small child whose hand is buried in the covert raise the hand and wave to the Chinese god, and then the Chinese god is enlightened. And now we can see how Wu Tai and the boy who lost his finger can be enlightened. They all stand before the mystery of something that, that they can perceive, but they can also see that other people perceive it, and so the mystery of that thing is not completely exhausted by any facility or anything that they have, any particular thing that they cling to. The Chinese god's uh, mastery, or his giant size and his hand, uh, he, he stands before the mystery of the mountain, because even though he can push it aside with his giant hand, he will never be able to bury a tiny hand in the clover on the mountainside in the way that the small child can. And so he, the giant Chinese god, will never be able to understand the mountain in the way that the child can bury his small hand in the clover on the mountainside can. The small child who does that and then waves at the giant also stands before the mystery of the mountain because the small child will never be able to push the mountain aside with a giant hand. He doesn't have that. So the mystery of the mountain also in its fullness, this, this great mystery of this thing, also eludes the small child no less than it, in its complexity, in its totality, no less than it eludes the small, the giant Chinese god. Similarly, with Gutai, and with the boy who loses his finger, Gutai will never be able to feel the mystery of the air that moves between the boy's fingers uh, where, the, where the missing finger once was. So the, the Gutai will never be able to, ex to, to feel the mystery of the air where, in the space where the finger is now missing on the boy. So that mystery, the fullness of the mystery of the air, is missing to Gutai, but it's accessible to the boy who lost his finger. But obviously the boy who lost his finger will never be able to experience the mystery of air available to Gutai, who can stick it in his mouth and then hold it up into the breeze. And so what we have once again in this case is the mystery of cool air that can never be fully encompassed by any one of the characters in the story, or the mystery of the mountain that can never be fully encompassed by the giant Chinese god, or by the small child who is reclining on the mountainside with its hand buried in the, gen the soft mountain, the clover on the side of the mountain. So we have the mystery of things that are accessible to all these characters, but also in the fullness of their mystery, elude them and can never become fully accessible. And this is the mystery of the world that this cone, through enlightening us and the characters in it, eventually comes to reveal as something that we can, each one of us can partially grasp in his or her own way, but that nobody 
can ever fully grasp in its entirety, and they can grasp that they can't grasp that, by, and so they don't cling to whatever it is that they have. They don't even cling to the understanding that they can't cling to anything. They just sort of meditate and peaceably, peacefully absorb this great mystery, whether it be of the mountain, or of the coolness of the air, or maybe it's a flower, or maybe it's an animal, or maybe it's some other wondrous thing in the world that we encounter in this very Zen way. So that's how I want to answer this cone in a Zen manner. And I think that you can see that it brings a kind of peacefulness, a kind of mindfulness before mystery that each one of us can access, access in our own unique way. But we also know when we become enlightened through meditation on this cone, Gutai's finger, that we can never fully fathom this mystery that other people can fathom parts of it that we can't, and we can fathom parts of it that they can't, and that itself is the great mystery that Gutai's finger unlocks for us in this Zen way. So that's what I wanted to talk about tonight, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry I stumbled over all the names because Japanese is not my native language, but I think you get the sense of what may be going on here, and possibly there are other ways of reading the cone that are very different from mine. Maybe you could figure out another way that would be even better as long as it leads you to some kind of peaceful mindfulness, some kind of peaceful meditation, some kind of realization and calmness that you did not previously have access to. Zen, at its best, does exactly that kind of thing. So on that note, I'd like to leave you this evening in silence. I'm going to model this outfit just a little bit more, and then I will wish everybody good night at the very end. So let me just take one more turn here. And sort of enjoy the mystery of this moment and share it with you. So this is Katya Eckhart, and I wish everybody a peaceful and a restful and enjoyable evening. Be good to each other, take care of each other until next time. Have a, a wonderful time, enjoy the rest of your summer. I look forward to talking to you again in the not-too-distant future. Bye-bye.